Hi class, welcome to week eight of wireless networking. So some of the key concepts and takeaways, uh, some of the points that you need to remember. The IEEE 802.11 protocols. So, so 802.1x is usually referring to something wireless and that includes Bluetooth, which is 802.15. And then, you know, you have uh, other wireless ranges and it all falls under that protocol suite uh, that was put forth by the, by the IEEE committee uh, or group and standards were set. So that is basically the standard that's being set. And then uh, side note, Wi-Fi is a marketing term that was uh, created way back when the wireless became a thing. Uh, Instead of people remembering 802 dot whatever, uh, they just remember either wireless or Wi-Fi. Again, Wi-Fi is a marketing term, and it's kind of like uh, almost like a name brand, like Bluetooth or you know Xerox or something like that, that uh, people remember. And so once they started that marketing campaign, the uh, the idea stuck, and we refer to it now as Wi-Fi. Really doesn't mean anything as far as like the Fi part of Wi-Fi. Uh, again, it's just a marketing campaign. So some frequencies, the 2.4 gigahertz, the 5 gigahertz ranges for the various applications are things that you will have to remember for not only the test, but if you start uh, managing a network, especially a wireless network. The 2.4 gigahertz range used to be problematic for Wi-Fi because so many other devices would broadcast on that range. And I mean, you'd even have interference from from phones, uh, from different things that, again, that use that range. So they moved to the five gigahertz range. It doesn't mean that they've eliminated interference because there is still interference, but it just gives a wider range to choose from. Uh, there are more channels and you know more ways to skip some of the interference that goes on. So the triple S, the uh, spread spectrum sequencing which uh, broadcast data to multiple frequencies at one time in order to find out where the AP or the device is, what frequency they're using so they can be begin communicating. And you have the FHSS, which is the frequency hopping spread spectrum. So it hops frequencies looking for the device that ne it needs to communicate with. And it does so, you know, it hops a frequency every few milliseconds in order to find that uh, that receiver. Then you have distributed spread spectrum sequencing, which is uh, similar to the FHSS, but instead of uh, one frequency being hit at one time, multiple frequencies. So it's kind of like the uh, standard spread spectrum, but also the it, it still hops frequencies. So it's it's hopping multiple frequencies at one time. Then you have the OFDM, which helps prevent ghost signals. So ghost signals is when an AP uh, sends out a signal and it starts bouncing off of walls or you know other objects in the area that reflect the signal back or deflect it back. The device receiving suddenly receives a second signal. So you know it's kind of like an echo. If you go into a canyon and you holler out, you know, hello. You get that hello 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 well it, it can be that same type of situation for a receiver all of a sudden it's getting echoes back and so where it would normally confuse the receiver the ofdm prevents that sort of thing from happening it receives a strong signal it says okay that is the signal i was supposed to receive and it ignores all of the echoes and of course the sta which means station uh, which is you know any kind of device that's going to send and receive on the wireless. Then you have your basic service set. So in your ESS or extended service set, that is how much Wi-Fi is going to cover the entire area that you service. So let's say it's a campus. That whole campus is going to be your ESS, but there are going to be multiple, many BSS or basic service sets within your extended service set. <clears throat> And what that means is you have an AP, it sends out a signal and it creates a basic service set. It is servicing the devices within its range, basically. And so 
you have multiple BSSs within an extended service set. So within your service area, you're gonna have a whole bunch of APs sending out signals and they're gonna create their own service area. The reason we do that is because if you have two APs and they're communicating, you can actually set up the BSS so the two APs don't cancel each other out. So if you've ever used a walkie-talkie and, uh, and you go to you know transmit, at the same time somebody else is transmitting or talking, you could cut each other off because both are sending the same signal at the same time. And so instead of canceling each other out with a wireless AP, you set up a BSS, which means this is my service area. This is how much signal I'm going to send out. This is how big it is. This is the spectrum, the frequency I'm going to use. And then the other AP has the same thing set up. So even if they overlap, which is a lot of times what you do in a mesh network, they overlap so that way as a person's traversing from one BSS to the next, they don't lose signal. They know that, okay, this one's operating on this channel. This one's operating on this channel. This is their service area. And, you know, it, it not only allows for proper service, but, you know, you can set up security. You can also, uh, on the management side, you can see, you know, how the various devices within that service area for security purposes, if you need to track something down, it gets you, you know, it tells you where that device is located, etc. Then, of course, you have your SSID, which is the service set identifier. That's the name of the wireless that's being broadcast. And you can have multiple SSIDs being broadcast from one wireless system. Just keep in mind, the more you have, the less bandwidth you're going to be you're going to have because those frequencies are cutting into the bandwidth. You're losing your channels. You're losing how much can actually be given out to clients. So, I mean, just kind of like a water pipe, you know, the more you tap into it, the less water there is going to be for everybody. And then they talked about, then we go over the WAP, the WAP, Wireless Access Point Mesh Network. Uh, again, we that's why we set up the BSS. You, so you move from one BSS to the next with your mesh network without losing signal. They're all, all of the APs are meshed together. They all send signals and cover your ESS. So in an endpoint communication, what exactly happens? So you have a device that sends a request to send RTS to the receiver. The receiver then responds, yes, you're clear to send and information or data packets are sent. Then the receiver sends back an acknowledgement package or packet. So you have your send ACK responses. And that actually happens frequently, even during, so device connects to a wireless AP, you know, hey, I need to, re, I need to send information. The AP says, yes, go ahead, I'm, I'm ready to receive. And the computer then sends information and the AP responds, got it, I'm sending it on. That happens many times. That's what TCP IP does. It makes sure that those packets are being kept track of that. Yes, I received it. Go ahead and send the next one. And we talked about how in TCP, how the packet sequencing happens to where as packets are being received, it's acknowledged. I got it. Send on the next one. And the device, the sender sends the next packet. And then I got it. An acknowledgement packet goes back and et cetera, et cetera. So you will need to know the ABGN and AC channels and their speeds and what frequencies they work on for the test. And of course you have channel bonding, which uses two or more channels for speed. Uh, they can't overlap. So the overlap is used for coverage, but the channels have to be several channels apart. So that way you don't overlap. Again, it's kind of like the, uh, go back to the walkie talkie scenario to where if the channels are too close to each other, you can still step on somebody. And so to prevent that, that's why you have channels that are actually separate. Infrared and Bluetooth were discussed. Infrared is for short transmissions. Uh, send a receiver, it uses light, kind of like fiber, except <laughs> much less reliable and much, you know, it can't go as far as fiber can, of course. So infrared uses the infrared spectrum to transmit data from 
a sender to a receiver, such as your remote control for your television. Though most, a, a lot of TVs now use uh, a, basically a wireless signal to send that, uh, send that information to the television. But it's good for basic commands. So again, uh, remote to the television, it's, it's sending very short command, you know, basically turn on, turn off, you know, just some very, very basic commands. Then you have Bluetooth, uh, which is, you know, they've improved it over the years, but you still have a distance issue and you have to keep in mind security as well, because a lot of Bluetooth devices will just continually broadcast, hey, I'm available to connect. And so that's definitely something you want to keep an eye on. Bluetooth uh, sets up a personal area network or PAN as they call it. So when it connects to a device, it's creating its own little network, so to speak. So if you have a smart TV, you could, and you have a device such as an iPad or even your computer, if it's Bluetooth enabled, could search for, let's say, that, that TV if that's how it communicates and it'll show up in your Bluetooth devices, available Bluetooth devices. And you can also search for your neighbor's TVs as well. <laughs> there, is a, uh, there is a code that's needed to connect the devices. They do have some security in there. So that way you can't just go connect to some random Bluetooth device and either see, get information or you know take over that device. But it's still something to keep in mind. So again, Bluetooth operates uh, under the 802.15 uh, protocol, and it sends signals on the 2.4 to 2.45 gigahertz range. And as we talked before, uh, there are security issues with Bluetooth, so keep that in mind. And these days, Bluetooth it seems to be replaced more and more, especially with smart devices with Wi-Fi rather than with just Bluetooth which gives it more capabilities. Also, Bluetooth sends a connection via Bluetooth to establish that, that pan, but then oftentimes if it needs to, let's say you are screencasting it, it switches over to a wireless signal. Because it's created its pan, it's able to switch signals and use up some of your wireless signal to transmit that information. Some basic security concepts when you set up your wireless network, especially at home. Um, but as a network admin, you get devices and you definitely want to make sure that there are no defaults left, uh, such as the default user, the default password, uh, and even the default SSID. You want to change all of that. Uh, again, especially for your home network, if you're going to be, uh, if you want it secure and if you don't want everybody in the world connecting to it, you definitely need to change all of that information. With changing that as well, it prevents you know, anybody from connecting to your network, using up your bandwidth, and also probing your network and looking for your devices to connect to. Uh, so yeah, definitely wanna, wanna change that information. Also change the information on your uh, router login. If you're setting up a home network, your wireless router login. Uh, not, not your wireless signal, but your actual router login, how you manage it, the management console side of things. You wanna change that as well. Because if somebody was able to connect to your network, you want to make sure that they can't change any settings in your network. For your home network, you'll need to set the security for WPA personal or WPA2, uh, preferably the latter, it's more secure. And then of course, for your enterprise environment, you'll be setting it for the WPA2 enterprise level. In order to increase security, the difference between the two, between WPA to enterprise and WPA2 personal is that the enterprise requires like a radius server or attack act server in order to verify the user. So, and you can set this up at home too if you really wanted to play with it and of course beef up your security. But the radius or attack act server is going to rely upon Active Directory or AD in order to verify user information a lot of times. Uh, so that way, let's say a person, your computers are on a domain and your users are domain users. When they go to connect to the wireless, it says, okay, what's your username and password? You enter that information. It goes to the radius server. The radius server then queries AD and says, hey, is this, is this user legit? Is he active? Uh, you know, 
is the login information correct? And then all of that is transmitted back. IoT devices, Internet of Things devices. This is, uh, you'll see more and more of these as time goes on. We're seeing more and more of these things as time goes on. You know, smart TVs, um, smart refrigerators. Uh, you have your um, various personal assistant devices around the house. Uh, you have thermostats. You have, I mean, just a myriad of things that qualify as an Internet of Things device. And it transmits its information back to uh, the Internet, a cloud uh, server of some sort, a, a cloud host. So, for instance, uh, Ring, the Ring doorbell. You can actually set up Ring as a home security. And it transmits... Uh, you can pay for a service and it transmits recordings and so forth up to the Ring Cloud uh, servers. That is an Internet of Things device. It's nothing that you manage. It manages itself and it talks back to a third party. So they can be very helpful, but they also present possible security risks. And in an enterprise environment especially, you have to be aware of IoT devices. Um, not only ones that you are okay with being on your network, you need to make sure that they're up to date and that there's no way for them to be hacked. And, and because Internet of Things devices are known for being uh, kind of weak on the security side, they pump these things out. They're kind of disposable in one sense. So a lot of companies aren't too worried about security. They're more trying to meet deadlines and you know the bottom line of making sure that they have a device out there that functions and does what they want it to do and security kind of becomes the secondary thing because it's like well you know who in the world is going to hack a thermostat you know they said that about baby monitors and things and it, some of those things can be hacked so not only for the information that those devices have because a lot of those devices collect a lot of information but also it provides a weak spot on the network just like printers that broadcast a wireless signal, if it's not managed properly, it can become a weak spot in your network. And a hacker who's roving about and sees that signal can use that to begin to penetrate the network. So just keep in mind, IoT devices can present some security issues, especially those that only support the WEP. In other words, you know, super basic security. And I've seen those as well, that uh, a lot of people like, oh, this is a great idea. They go out and they purchase it and they think, okay, well, you know, the business has a network and surely we can just bring these on, connect them to the network. It's wireless after all. And, you know, these things they say they support wireless and they'll communicate back to the cloud. And the cloud is this magical thing where they can access that information from their smartphones. It sounds like such a cool idea. They can even do it when they're not at you know, the business site, uh, just super cool. And I've actually had this happen. They bring these devices on, they plug them in, they try to configure them, and things just aren't working. They spend a lot of time trying to get it to work. They get frustrated and they finally call IT and say, hey, you know, I can't get this stupid IoT device to work. They don't call it an IoT device, but <laughs> they, you know, I can't get this whatever device to work. And it's kind of like, whoa, that's news to me. I didn't realize that we were trying to connect this device. And they don't realize that they need to ask IT, uh, you know, in particular the network administrator, if bringing these devices within the business wireless is okay, uh, you know, they just don't understand. So a lot of times you are faced with that. I mean, uh, we've had devices that it's like, well, do some basic troubleshooting, reach out to the company and find out, no, this device is, you know, it's not secure. It can't connect to the wireless because it only uses WEP for one thing. We have you know, WPA2 enterprise level, uh, you know, Wi-Fi. And these devices can't connect to it. There's nothing I can do about that. And I'm not about to create a WEP ad hoc wireless network just to connect these little IoT devices that, you know, they do a small service anyway. It's not like it's life-threatening. So some things to keep in mind. <clears throat> If you work for the hospital system, IoT devices are everywhere. 
and some of those are, speaking of life-threatening devices, some of those are required to be connected to the network regardless because they report information back to a central system for keeping track of patients, the patient's health, etc. So some of that can be pretty important. Um, sometimes you kind of have to split the middle and find, okay, this thing is not super secure. I'm going to put it on my watch list and constantly monitor this side of things. Perhaps we can create an ad hoc network just for these devices and pretty much lock it down to where, you know, it's hopefully not as visible. Maybe the, the SSID is not being broadcast or something to, you know, help start locking some of that down. Sometimes, again, you, you have to do the best you can. All right, OSA, Open System Authentication, uses MAC addresses to connect to a wireless network. This allows you to filter MAC addresses as well. So devices that try to connect to the network, if their MAC address is on a, a whitelist, then they're able to connect. If they're on a blacklist, or a lot of times it's just if they're not on the whitelist, then they're automatically on the blacklist and they can't connect until they're put onto the whitelist. So that is a means of security that you can use to uh, connect devices, including IoT devices. So 802.1x uses the radio and TAC, a radius and TAC X servers for authentication. And you'll hear 802.1x talked about a lot. That covers that suite of protocols that uh, those standards of security that uh, provide, again, security for the wireless. Then you have shared key authentication that was discussed, which is encrypted keys uh, to secure the connection between two vices, devices. So as you get into cybersecurity, and even in the networking class, uh, when you go to take the Networking Plus exam, you'll need to know some of the security that goes on. We'll talk more about that later on, but um, shared key authentication, SKA, is where devices, when they go to connect, they say, hey, I need to, I need to connect. I need to connect to the wireless. I need to you know, be a part of this network. The receiver is set up to handle security and say, okay, we're gonna start our transmission. Here's basically a secret password. It's encrypted, which activates a secret password from you know, the sender. And so they share a a way to decrypt, decrypt information that's being transmitted back and forth. Again, that's a very simplified uh, way of explaining things, and we'll get more into that uh, later in the semester. But the keys, the SKA keys, are used to decrypt information, uh, to decipher that information because it's been encrypted. All right, you're called to design a wireless network. What are some of the things you need to do? You need to prepare. And you think, well, that's obvious. Well, <laughs> there are there are ways to prepare. So figure out your network requirements. You know what exactly is going to be needed. What type of devices are connecting to it? You know your how big the service area needs to be. Uh, that will identify what type of access points and so forth is going to be needed. How and how many access points are going to be needed? And you know, is this going to be a radius? Is it going to be a tac -X? You know, what are you going to use to you know, authenticate users basically to your Wi-Fi. Now you need to also identify expectations of people. So they, they'll come to you and say, Hey, I want to do wireless on the campus. And that's again, broad statement. They have no idea what that entails. And so you go, okay, what exactly do you want? Do you want to, you know, we've got multiple buildings. We've got multiple floors on each building. We've got different types of users. We've got different types of devices. What are you thinking? Because a lot of times they have something in mind. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I want to connect my my smartphone to Wi-Fi. I don't want to have to, you know, pay for data. Or, you know, some buildings, because of the way they're designed, they actually cut off cell signal. And not only can they not browse on their phone, but uh, that does become a security issue. If somebody is away from their desk, a lot of times their cell phone is the only way to call for help. So you know, calling over wireless sometimes is an option. 
just as some rough examples. So some of those things they'll present to you, you know, the, and then, uh, okay, do you require wireless outside? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, how far outside do you want it? You know, if you're on a giant property, are we going to be covering, so such as a, you know, college or high school campus, you know, they've got, uh, you know, they've got a football team, so they have a football field. They have track, so the track, you know, field out there, um, swim team, you know, there's a swimming pool. What exactly do we need? And, you know, are we going to be doing security cameras or, you know, how is that going to, how is that going to work? And a lot of times, speaking of outdoor areas, there isn't power and there isn't uh, ethernet. There's no data run anywhere. So it moves it into the wireless realm. So again, when you ask, what are you expecting? It kind of gives you an, an idea of what to design or how to design the network. Then you conduct a radio frequency modeling. You do a site survey. So you walk around the, you know, the, the buildings, you walk around the outside, whatever has been included in, you know, just because side note, just because when you ask, what are your expectations? They say, oh yeah, we only need it within this one area. Try to look ahead down the road and say, okay, well, you'll probably also want it eventually here. Because one thing you don't want to do is go into all this planning, all of this expense of buying all of the equipment, you've budgeted it and everything, you've even hired people to come out and do the install. They install it all, it's all great and wonderful. You know, a few months down the road, it's all done, and everybody's happy with Wi Fi. And then the administration comes to you and says, uh, Yeah, it'd be really nice if we could have Wi Fi out here on the football field so we could actually stream the football games. And it's like, well, you can start another project, but sometimes it's nice to clump it all together in one giant project. Sometimes it can be cheaper to do it that way. Plus, you don't have to keep planning these things. You know, you can just think, okay, you only want it here, but what about the football field? You think you'll ever want to stream football games? Or, you know, how about we just go ahead and do it just so that way it's covered? And then, because you know later down the road, they're going to go, this is so awesome, let's do this. So, some things to keep in mind. So, do your site survey. Walk around. Uh, there are free apps that you can use on your phone. If you've already got wireless set up in various places, kind of figure out exactly, you know, where the, where the dead spots are with the current wireless situation. Uh, you know, can you make do with what you've got just by adding to it? You know, seriously, if, if you've already got a good system that's not needing to be replaced, perhaps you can just add to it. And so find the, uh, the wireless dead spots. Uh, beware of radio frequency obstructions and, inter and interference. Trees, buildings, hills, uh, radio towers, power lines, just a myriad of things that can deflect and reflect signals, wireless signals. So, you know, for instance, uh, at the college campus, out in the parking lot, we have, finally, uh, pretty much the whole parking lot is covered in, in Wi-Fi. Except for some of the spotty areas near the trees. Uh, we just could not, no matter what we did, because of the way everything was set up, we couldn't get wireless underneath certain tree areas. So there, it's spotty. It still gets wireless signal, but as the wind blows and depending on the time of year, those leaves will definitely reflect the wireless signal. So it's something to keep in mind. Be aware of where the access points are going to be mounted. Finding the best places for access points, what's most practical. Uh, and again, keeping in mind, is there power nearby? Is there data? You know, how practical is it to put a wireless access point? So going back to the parking lot thing, there are large sections of the parking lot that there is no power, there's no data, and to run power and or data out to certain areas would be so expensive. Just so people have wireless out there in the parking lot. It's just not cost effective. But we have a, Saracosa has a large radio tower. Keeping in mind the interference, the RF interference, uh, we were able to still mount several APs, directional APs, up on the tower that point 
various directions and provide wireless coverage for the parking lot. Again, is there power? How about network? Beware of uh, device density and what types of devices and frequencies are being used. So hospitals are notorious for uh, radio frequency interference inside buildings because you have so many different devices that are sending off so many different signals. And, you know, there's so much power. X-ray machines, uh, monitors, uh, even elevators can a lot of times disrupt a wireless signal. So it's something to be aware of. Uh, device density. How many devices are going to be connecting to your wireless network? If you have very dense population of devices trying to connect to the network, it's going to use up the available bandwidth, IPs. Um, you know, you, you definitely need to make sure that your devices and your network are capable of handling the the amount of traffic that's going to be on there. Now, a lot of APs, they allow you to adjust the power. So if you know, you can turn it way down just to service this one area. And that's good enough. But then you start finding, well, we actually need it to go a little bit further out and there are more devices connecting to it. And it's just, it's bogging this thing down. So you increase the power of that AP in order to strengthen the signal. And then also, if your subnet is large enough, it can handle the, the traffic or the amount of devices connecting to the network. Uh, when you do your site survey, heat map is good. So if you hire somebody professional to come out, or again, there are uh, apps, there are programs that you can use, you can walk around and figure out where your signals are weakest and where they're strongest. And then you kind of start from there. And then during a site survey, a lot of times a mobile AP is taken along and somebody with a receiving device, those two devices, they're not connected to a real network. That AP is like plugged into a battery or something that allows it to send off a signal and they figure out, okay, here's a dead spot based upon the current Wi-Fi situation. Here's a dead spot. We need to mount an AP. Where is the best place for this AP? And they walk around with basically the AP on a stick. You know, they'll climb up in different locations and so forth, and they will figure out, okay, this is where the AP needs to be in order to get rid of this dead spot. So that is also part of a site survey. And a lot of times when you do it professionally or have it professionally done, they will send you back a heat map, which shows you your, uh, you know, the business, its buildings, outside Wi-Fi if you're, if you're gonna use it and you know where all your dead spots are, where the best signal is, etc. We talked about the IP subnet range in order to handle all of the devices that are connecting. Also know your antennas. Are they focused? Are they omnidirectional? Uh, so for outdoor APs especially, you'll need to know this information. Some antennas can switch back and forth. Some can actually send a signal omnidirectionally, but then they have an attachment that plugs into that particular access point that sends a focused signal. And that focus signal can, it goes out in a cone shape. It can broadcast to a wide area, or you can have a very focused uh, signal that's being sent out to an AP receiver. So we talked about the football field. They want to stream, but there's no power. There's no network nearby. And so you're kind of stuck with figuring out how to get a wireless signal out there. Well, you can use a directional AP. So you've got power and data at one location. You can actually shoot and some of these things, they go miles. You can actually shoot a directional AP at a receiver um, that is able to be tapped into power, let's say up at the press box. And <clears throat> it receives that signal and transmits it down via an ethernet cable to let's say a switch. And you can set it up to where that then provides network for the press box and you can connect other wireless access points around the area that has extended your network out to that football field now due to the directional AP. So again, know your antennas. And of course we talked about mesh networks and how APs can be set up to where they provide continuous service for anybody walking around in the area as well as redundancy. You can set up redundant, uh, redundant mesh network for wireless as well. All right, that's the end of the lecture. I hope all of that makes sense. If you have any questions, please let me know.